Alright, so here we are, one of the uh, elephants. And the cool thing about these guys is that, is that they have really, really, really long um, fronts. Me at the zoo, the first video ever uploaded to YouTube, was published on April 23rd, 2005 by Jared Kareem, the site's co-founder. The site officially launched in December of that year and was already reaching over 8 million views per day. There wasn't the idea of a YouTuber back then, it was just, oh, here's a new website you can upload videos to. You know, it was 2006, so it was just another place to upload yeah. the most harmless type of content. You know, like, here's my day out with my friends. Let's go, let's jump, DJ make the speakers pop. As of 2018, YouTube is the second most popular website in the world and made over $10 billion in revenue in 2017 alone. Content is no longer limited to grainy, unproduced home videos, but entire TV series and films. Stop! I'm from the future! Tom Ridgewell, aka Tom Scar, is a YouTube content creator based in London. His most popular video on YouTube has 62 million hits, an audience figure that traditional TV networks would kill for. Yeah, people in traditional media really strongly dislike YouTube and YouTube content as a whole. I think it, a lot of that comes from this fear of, of rivalry and that we're taking their jobs. But I think the fact that a lot of us are fast tracking our careers is a factor as well. Whilst many identify the likes of Amazon and Netflix as threats to traditional broadcasters, it's important to consider if just moving linear television online is even a big enough move. 2016 survey by Comscore Barb found that if forced to choose, 41% of the UK's 16 to 24 demographic would choose YouTube as a source of their entertainment content over television or subscription services such as Netflix. The production process and relationship between content creators and audience are nowhere more different than with online video. And so the question needs to be asked, is this TV's biggest threat? Ever since it first started publishing its annual viewing report back in November 2013, TV viewing figure analyst Barb has acknowledged that TV figures on average are declining, albeit slowly. Younger generations, typically defined as being between 16 and 24, can clearly be seen to be leading this charge, with their figures decreasing more than any other age bracket. In a similar time frame, the popularity of YouTube can be seen to increase. I think my audience is about 70 to 80 percent male um and of those you know it's 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 mostly teen to you know early 20s with younger audiences finding the ability to source their entertainment elsewhere youtube and online video can be seen to be in the early stages of the technology adoption life cycle a sociological model designed in 1957 which specifically designates young people to be early adopters of technologies which will later achieve widespread acclaim. In 2015, viewing traditional live TV was lowest among 16 to 24 year olds, accounting for just 36% of all their viewing. When contrasting this with older audiences, defined as laggards, for whom live TV accounts for 83% of viewing, the technology adoption life cycle strongly suggests that online media's popularity will only rise and spread from its current point, likely damaging traditional media in the process. The notion that 16 to 24 year olds are leading the rise of online content is therefore not merely a coincidence. Along with the ease of accessing YouTube content is the potential failings of traditional media to engage with this demographic. In 2016, 59% of young people told Comcast and Barb that online content is more likely to represent things they're passionate about than television is. On commercial television, audience figures define what advertising can be sold within a TV program and therefore control which shows get renewed, often making it hard to commission programming based on niche interests, something YouTube's international audience makes significantly simpler. One example of this could be that 33.8% of content uploaded to YouTube in 2015 was focused solely around gaming, whereby televised coverage has often failed both in the UK and also in the US. The most relevant examples of this content on British TV would be Channel 5's The Gadget Show, which pulls in a peak viewership of 1 million people, or Go 8-Bit on the digital channel Dave, which peaks at around 300,000. Comparing these to PewDiePie, YouTube's most successful star, who found fame with his gaming videos, it's clear to understand the popularity of YouTube as a platform. PewDiePie has over 60 million online subscribers, and his content averages at 3 million views over its first 24 hours online. His most popular video has over 80 million hits. And so these videos can be very attractive to advertisers and very profitable for YouTube and YouTubers.
It was around about uh, the time I went to university in 2008, mid-2008, when they introduced the partnership program, which uh, mm -hmm. enables you to monetize your content. Advertising companies will come to YouTube and say, here's our advert uh, and $10 million, please display this on 100,000 videos or something. And then each time those videos are shown against a creator's video, they get, you know, I think 60% of that revenue split with YouTube. But it wasn't until, you know, my last year of university in, in 2011 that it became, I was generating enough money to uh, earn an, a reasonable wage. Yeah, I'd say probably around about 2011 when I left school for good. I think, but I think mid-2011 I had, early 2011 I think I had about 200,000 subscribers. Um, and that was at a million by the end of 2012. Yeah, I think that's about right. Another major cause for the TV to YouTube audience movement is likely to be the freedom and choice that is offered by content that can be generated at a faster rate, more empowered to meet audience reactions to prior content. I think we have a huge power in that we don't have a middleman. We don't have a boss saying, this is what the kids like. We are, we have an idea. We write it, we film it and we upload it and then we get instant feedback and that will affect the next thing we do. Whereas in, in TV, you know, you have an idea, you pitch that idea, that idea gets changed and based on what they think people will like, then they go, then maybe three years later that idea comes to light. Um, and even by then you're working on an out, outdated trends and, and, and public interest. So it is a lot easier to figure out what people want and adapt our content to match the needs of, of of the masses. We can churn content out much faster than traditional media. Writing in a 2012 journal, Jin Kim defines the primary qualities of UGC, user-generated content, as being amateurism and populism, describing how these are the antithesis to PGC, professor generated content, and network video services likely to be offered by more traditional media giants, such as the BBC. You know, it really is a truly unfiltered view into someone's life. And also we're very accessible. You know, we are on Twitter. We don't have huge PR teams which, you know, when handled right, can be quite a wonderful thing. When handled, you know, not so right, it can wind up with you getting someone show up at your front door. Because people have always been obsessed with celebrity and, 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 and public figures. And, and while, you know, they may have to sit around and wait two weeks for the latest photograph of Katie Price to show up, uh, they can just hop on Twitter or, or YouTube and, and see literally daily updates from much more accessible creators who have much more normal lives. Whilst YouTube has proven that it can generate high revenues for its stars and has certainly attracted the attention of commercial partners, is this definitely a benefit? When discussing the role of advertising in online media, Jin Kim uses the phrase, what the media industry wants, to define possible futures for YouTube's content. Even acknowledging that YouTube has itself become an industry is potentially dangerous to its future, contrasting with the amateurish appeal that supposedly drives online video. Actually, making the commitment to have a, a proper company uh, mm -hmm. with, with with employees, you know, people who work with me near enough every day. That was something that I, I spent a long time putting off. Whilst becoming more professional contrasts with YouTube's most attractive feature, it is essential to conclude that if YouTube wishes to grow further, this simply must occur. The actual formation of Turbo Bunch Limited as a company mostly came about for financial and tax reasons. In 2015, Paul Lee concluded that online video would not replace TV, however instead represents a parallel future for the media industries. Less of a threat for those in traditional media, and more of an opportunity. In 1913, German writer Wolfgang Reipel formulated a concept that we now refer to as Reipel's Law. He proposed that when new forms of media emerge, it is unlikely that they will replace and make obsolete older mediums, and instead, a convergence takes place in their field leading to a different way and field of use for those older forms. The theory was updated in 2006 by German CEO Matthias Dopfner, who modernised the theory by adding that whilst the CD and MP3 revolutions may seem to disprove the rule, it is relevant that the actual content, music, has not changed, just the technology which delivers such content to audiences. It could be argued, therefore, that the attempt of mass media giants to enter the online video space is evidence of such a convergence taking place, and that traditional television will begin to take advantage of the possibilities the internet grants it, modernising itself in the process. 
While streaming services already present an example of this, so does BBC Three, which ceased broadcasting as a linear TV station to become an online-only channel hosted through BBC iPlayer in 2015. At the time, controller of BBC Three Dan Kavanagh said that this would allow the channel to be freed from the constraints of linear TV, therefore highlighting that the mindset of online video is becoming present in the wider media landscape. I think sites like YouTube and, and Netflix will be cornerstones, you know, like you know, ITV or Channel 4 uh, or BBC One or whatever, you know, they're not going to take over, they're not going to completely monopolize, but I think they'll just be parts of this new economy, um, staples even. So I don't think one thing can take over, but I think, yeah, the shift is that we like to be connected and we like to have a, a ridiculous amount of choice. In conclusion, the overall medium of television does not seem to face a significant threat from YouTube. However, the conventions and processes of the medium must change in order to take advantage of the opportunity that presents itself. If willing to adapt, traditional television has a place in the future. However, remaining stagnant if YouTube continues to grow will likely see audience figures continue to decline. Individuals such as Thomas Ridgewell have pioneered a new genre that looks only to continue its growth. The major threat to professional television, therefore, is its own desperation to profit from this new form of entertainment.